Now, time for our special guest. Chuck Wright first came to prominence with a quiet riot back in the early 1980s and was involved in that era-defining album, Mental Health, which became the very first heavy metal album to make it to number one on the Billboard charts. Now, he's also been involved with some of the really great melodic hard rock bands of the time as well over the years, including uh, Gavria and House of Lords. Back to now, though, he has just released his very first solo album under the moniker Chuck Wright's Sheltering Sky. And this is as far away from a Quiet Riot record as you can possibly get. Now, I spoke to him from his L.A. base last week and we talked about the new project. Plus, look back over 40 years of association with Quiet Riot. And why weren't Gufria and House of Lords the mega bands, which perhaps they should have been? First, though, here's a taste from that new album, Chuck Wright's Sheltering Sky. This is a, a very diverse array of styles and sounds that blend together to give something that's very new. It sounds vibrant and it sounds quite welcome, actually, as opposed to just another rock album. And I think people might be a bit surprised you know, outside of um, your listening circle, there are so many things from uh, fusion and funk, rock, and even this Celtic influence, uh, yeah. which is in there as well. Well, you know, um, I never intended on doing a solo record. Um, when the pandemic hit, I just took a bad situation and now had the time because I was on the road every weekend and running a thing in Hollywood I do called Ultimate Jam Night, which is coordinating... 50 to almost 100 sometimes um, professional musicians, which is much like herding cats, so it takes up all your time. So, <laughs> you know, so I sat down and just, you know, the feeling of, it, it was apocalyptic feeling the way the world was right then. There was nobody in the major cities on the streets. And I sat down and wrote this first song called The Weight of Silence because it was a heavy weight with all, you know, how silent the world had tur been turned into. And I wrote this piece, and, and I edited together a video um, of some drone footage that was going on with the empty you know, major cities, and um, I played everything myself. And uh, I just put it out, and then I got a call from Troy Lachetta from Tesla, and he really dug it and offered to put some drums on it. And I said, yeah, I never thought about that, but that'd be cool, and he did. And, and then uh, an amazing guitar player named Alan Hines, who's a top jazz fusion player, threw some soloing on it, and I then I after that I edited that stuff together. Then I reached out to Derek Sherinian, my friend, who I heard really liked the song, and he did some keyboards on it. And that's how that whole, then I did a re-edit, and then that's how that one um, all came together. And I just found out a couple of days ago that it won best instrumental and and best video at the uh, music uh, the Rock Music Alliance Awards. And I wasn't even I was brilliant. Yeah, I wasn't aware I was nominated, and there was you know it, the other nominees along with me were. Like Joe Satriani and John Five, John Five and other people like that, so I was I was like really taken back. Anyway, that I had no plan to do a solo record, so I was just the reason it's so diverse and eclectic is because I just was writing music that I wanted to listen to, you know, music that I that I'm into, and and uh, I never yeah you know, I got I got like five songs finished, and I I did a video for uh, my cover of Bjork's Army of Me, which I know is kind of a surprise to people, but. That was a, a track. Um, I found some tracks that I recorded some years back with my late friend Pat Torpy of Mr. Big and Lanny Cordola, who I've done many an album with and was also in House of Lords. Um, and we were in the studio writing songs, and, and we just started jamming on uh, the Bjork tune because it has that John Bonham drum drum sample that she did, and then Pat started playing it. We just jammed on it, and I found it. And I said, this is brilliant. i got to finish this. And um, I found a great voice named uh, Whitney Ty, who um, is somebody that I discovered singing at Ultimate Jam Night. And um, we hit it off, and she actually wrote another song on my album and sings one of my favorite songs on the album called Giving Up the Ghost. So I put, I got together with a, um, a 3D animator friend, and we put together a video. So here I am. I've got five songs. Yes, they're all over the map stylistically. And this video, and I said, hey, maybe somebody would be interested, you know. So I shopped it around, and... Brian Pereira at Cleopatra Records totally got it, dug it. I was able to finish my other songs that I'd already started. And uh, that's how it turned into a solo album. Um, I know you mentioned the Celtic piece. That's actually, yeah. that's a song that um, 
from the Young Bloods that came out in 1969 that I've always loved um, my whole life. It's been one of those songs that I've wanted to do. You know, it just was always I've got to do this song one of these days. You know, so I decided to. Do I wrote a note next to it. Okay. And I'd written underneath that, I put Laurel Canyon. It sounded like it was um, it was a song that was put together around that time. So I wasn't far off there. No, really. you weren't. It was and, um, you know, it's, it's called Darkness, Darkness. And the singer on yeah. it did a phenomenal job. His name is David Victor. He sang with the band Boston for a couple of years. And he's a very close friend of mine. And actually, there's 41 different people on this that, that are friends and great musicians and singers and and uh, they all joined to be on this album. That's why Sheltering Sky. I didn't want to say Chuck Wright and then the band. The project is Chuck Wright Sheltering Sky because I'm kind of the the umbrella over everybody at my Ultimate Jam Night thing. And then on this record, it's the same kind of vibe. So um, I chose that as the the name of the whole the whole thing. You, know, you pull together this this great musical collective to work on this, and you can always tell i think the standing of the musician who's putting it together i.e you by those that you get involved and you said 40 odd people you got people from asia dream theater mr big tesla skid row and i did make a, again a special note about this great female vocal talent whitney ty and she sounded similar to somebody called Maya Wynn, who Andy Curran and Alex Lifeson have just found and put on an album called Envy of None. Uh, but she's got a very, very atmospheric uh, voice when you yeah. tie. So how did you, where did she come from? I mean, I know you talk about the ultimate jam night. Yeah, did she right. just rock up? You'd... No, I mean, I, I discovered her, um, I saw one of her videos from her, uh, her last album. It's called Apogee. And I go, wow, this girl, this girl's great. And I reached out to her and said, hey, do you want to ever do Ultimate Jam Night? I'd love to have you come down. And then I think she did uh, Nothing Compares to You, um, you know, my, uh, the Prince song that Sinead she honored it, And it was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And so when I was trying to think of the right voice for Army of Me, um, she came right to, to, you know, to my head and I reached out to her. And she goes, I love Bjork. I'd love to do it. And then since then, we've developed a, a great relationship. She's like family now. It's 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 awesome. We wrote a song on the album together called "Time Waits for No One." I had the music, and I had the 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 title and that one chorus riff. And then I said, "Hey, you want to finish this off with me?" And and what she came up with is brilliant. And uh, and then I had her sing "Given Up the Ghost" as well on the album, which is one of my favorite songs on the record. Um, In, interesting video to Bjork's Army of me the he reference to the ruth ginsburg isn't there the subject matter and the lyrics are all very much of the time that yeah. we are living in right well you know that that all my i have a friend named drew lanius he's a 3d animator and he was working on something and i go you know what would be great i, I talked to him about it he loved the song and and um i said you know it'd be great if we you know ruth just passed and there's there's like an army of people that still believe in in her views on human rights and and we were coming out of a turbulent, like, riots everywhere. and just insane time here in the United States. Um, I, yes, I, yes. I, I guess it might have been like that a little bit over there, too. But, I mean, it was crazy. And so I just kind of took that element and, and created it in the video. That's why you see all the – there's riot footage and there, there's just a lot of craziness mixed in with live performance. Um, and it's kind of trippy. She's floating through the air. Uh, Whitney Ty is a character in it, actually, and she's floating through the air, and then she joins the army of Ruth Ginsburg's marching on Washington. It's, you know, it's a little, I'm really into sci-fi and things like that, so that has elements of that in it. And um, I don't know if you've seen my new my new single, um, Throwing Stones. Um, yes, yeah, that, yeah. That, video. that, that song uh, is an anti-war message song, but it was written lyrically before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um and so I felt, and it was written lyrically by, and vocal melodies by Joe Retta, who um, sang with Dio Disciples, Sweet, and Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Good friend. He, we did Heaven and Earth together. I did an album with that band, and he was the singer. Just phenomenal singer, and a very good friend, another great friend. I just sent him the track, the funk track, and I said, hey, check this out. And, you know, it's been, one reviewer said it sounded like a cross between, after he sang it, it sounded like a cross between... Um, Primus and Stevie Wonder, which it's hard to imagine. But when I sit back and listen to the song, I go, yeah, I can, I get that, you know. But um, so I felt the need <laughs> at that time 
when you know the record's coming out, I'm going to make another video. What song I picked that song because of the energy of the song, and you know I get to show off a little bit in it as a bass player, but also it was so timely. It, the message in the song it's throwing stones. We started as humans throwing stones at each other. Now we're launching missiles and throwing grenades. And when are we going to learn? How much longer is the question that's posed in the in the song? How much longer till we learn? Mm. Now we we've got it. There's there's a big lack of empathy in the world right now. It's I don't know. Yeah, where's yeah. that spiraling? It's it's I, you know a lot of it's a lot of false information that's going out there and leading people down a dark path. Um, you know because there's a lot of gullible people, especially in this country, unfortunately. Um, anyway, so I made a video. Um, with my friend Tim, who also mixed the song, and he was a cinematographer, he was the editor, and he mixed the tune. He's brilliant. He's he. Uh, you'll see his name on the uh, album. He co-produced a few songs with me on the album, and he he wins awards as a film composer. Uh, so a lot of the songs on the album have a cinematic feel to it. I think the whole album kind of has that kind of cinematic feel, like a Pink Floyd album or whatever. It's it's real deep. And you feel like you're in a Well, you can never guess what's coming next. Well, that's way. on this record, you definitely know yeah. what's coming next. I did not want to be, and there's too many of them in my opinion, and I'm not dissing anybody because I love all these guys out there, but there's just too many cookie cutter uh, corporate sounding rock bands. You know, they're, it's like all the same writer yeah, yeah. Product to me. So, yeah, yeah. I, didn't I was going to say to you, a lot of. A lot of musicians who have spent as long in bands and around bands as you have yeah. tend to lose any individual identity uh, that they had and find it very difficult to do anything when they go solo, but a version of what band that they were in. Is this the album you've always wanted to make? And do you feel that now you uh, are solo at this moment that you've been set free oh yeah <laughs> people said man you were oppressed <laughs> if you know the back <laughs> you understand what I mean, but you don't so it's okay um yeah i was not allowed in, in certain situations to do my thing in the last many years but but i finally had the time to do it um i'm a i'm a writer on um i don't know if you were aware but a majority writer on the house of lords records and yes the, yes yeah. yeah yeah a lot of that material um, I brought in and, and finished out with the band and and I QR three the Quiet Ride three album, the two songs on that um, that I contributed one hundred percent of the music and vocal melodies uh, was Twilight Hotel and Still the Night which are pretty deep they're kind of ballady but interesting sound very different for Quiet Riot, um, but for me this album is I want and I'm hoping it'll be my legacy, um, you know I certainly. I wouldn't want the very first album I ever recorded on to be, you know, um, cause there's been a lot of growth. If you look at my discography, you'll see that I've done, uh, played on. There's a lot. <laughs> ambient trance, ambient trance record. I co-produced two reggae records. I was in a flamenco band for two years. Hence you'll see, you'll hear a little bit of that influence in weight of silence. Um, I've done, uh, SX 10, which was Cypress Hills singer, um, send dog, which is like a rap funk, uh, heavy, heavy record. I've even done country, um, you know, so, you know, the full gamut, if it's really quality and good, I'm into it. But um, my listening tastes are, are a little bit deeper. I don't really listen to hard rock when I, you know, if I'm going to put something on, I'll put on, you know, Sting or Seal or uh, Sarah McLaughlin or Lorena McKenna yeah, yeah. or Zero Seven or uh, Massive Attack, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, ah, massive attack come from yeah. uh, literally about a mile away from where I'm sat at the moment. Oh, really? I had no idea. That, but I'm into that kind of thing, you know, and there's elements mm. of that in in my music. And I've always been, um, it also, the prog element, which you kind of feel um, in some of the music, it, that started when I was, um, I didn't have a driver's license. So I think I was around 15. I'm, drive, I'm driving with my friend who borrowed my mom's car because he, he had a license. And we're driving by the Whiskey A Go Go, which is my home now, basically. Um, and it and it said yes, five dollars. And I said, hey, I heard that band's really good. We should go check them out. So keep in mind, at this time, I'm Black Sabbath, Deep Purple kid. That's what I'm into, right? I see yes, mm -hmm. totally blown away. And I got into all the prog, 
prog bands. In fact, in my 10th grade English class, I brought in 21st century schizoid band. Uh, <laughs> Ken band Crimson. By Ken <laughs> Crimson. And the teacher freaked out over the lyric, and, the, and she made the class listen to the whole album. And they're all sitting there going, this is really Brilliant. weird. I, I saw the expressions on the kids' faces. They're going, what the hell is this? But uh, Well, you had your own, uh, your, your band, or the band at Satyr, wasn't yeah, it? Satyr, Back in, yeah. the, in the 70s. I did. Was, was prog. Yeah, it was. It was Zep, Queen, and Keyboards. Yeah, well, what it was, was it was, um, if you can imagine, Genesis meets Led Zeppelin, I mean, and Queen. It kind of right, it had a lot of those elements in it. We were the first band in rock and roll history to, to have a laser show. We knew the guy that developed the technology up at Pasadena Tech. So we're shooting the lasers off of mirrors, which is the first. And then we had our screen behind us, and he did like different designs and things going on during the show and we had two stages that looked like flying saucers, this huge keyboard rig, like a Keith Emerson key, uh, keyboard rig. Um, and that keyboard player is Pat Regan, who's gone on to produce uh, Deep Purple. He's working with Richie Blackmore on all of his records right now and he's done Mr. Big and he produced a Kiss record. Um, and he's a very good friend. And he's called me in for different sessions now and then. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a big deal back then. That was, uh, we were, but it wasn't in vogue, obviously, in that period of time. Right then, it was bands like The Knack, The Motels, uh, The Fix, In Excess. That kind of thing was what was going on. And um, at that time, I also ended up playing with uh, a band called Dubrow, which was Kevin Dubrow from the Randy Rhodes era, um, Quiet Riot. And I started playing bass with him and doing demos. And we started playing for record labels. And finally, you know, we got signed. And a lot of those demos ended up being the mental health record, which which is why I'm I'm the bass player on Bang Your Head, Don't Want to Let You Go, and uh, I sing on every track on that album. So that so I it's the fortieth anniversary, isn't it, of the of the time that you joined Quiet Riot? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, as right. they prepare for that mental health record, yeah. did you have any feeling that that album, whilst you were doing it, whilst you were all putting it together, that it would be something of a defining moment for the genre, heavy metal, because as we all know, it went on to become the first ever number one heavy metal album on the Billboard charts, which was a big, big thing. Yeah, it, it changed the fabric of the whole music scene where, where uh, you know, it was like I was saying, it was all the new wave bands that suddenly all the record companies wanted to sign bands with a lot of, with big hair and, and played hard rock. Um, what I thought personally at the time, I didn't think it would sell five copies, let alone 10 million. I mean, <laughs> only because, only because not because it wasn't good and done well. It's just that that music was not in at all. It was like not any more than my, my prog band was in. It was the same thing. It was like, what well, you know, I, I didn't, in, in fact, we're listening to the record and you know the tracks and stuff and i got into an argument along with the producer with kevin about doing come on feel the noise and he just didn't, was very resistant to it he didn't want to do any outside material and i said kevin really seriously lick, sit back do you hear anything that that would you would think is a chr hit song and chr is contemporary hit radio something that's going to be on, yeah, yeah. on pop radio state do you hear anything that can make this and I go, seriously, this song at least has a super catchy chorus, and we're, we're talking about it. You know, it's a Slade song. I'm, a lot of people think it's our, it was a Quiet Right song, but it's not. It's a Slade song. But um, but he, he succumbed, and look, sure enough, that's the song that blew open the doors for everybody, for all the, all the rock bands like Rat, Cinderella, uh, the list goes on. They would not have happened if it not if it were for that song. Who knows what would have happened? I don't really know. Maybe somebody else would have come up with something in that genre, and it'd be the new thing, you know, but we killed off. It was all very melodic, wasn't yeah, it, at the time? Yeah, it was all AOR, yeah. uh, FM, with the odd exception, Van Halen, who quite right played with, I, I saw a place called the Glendale Community College. Yeah, I, I uh, actually saw Van Halen um, before they got signed, um, playing at a club that we all played called the Starwood, which was a very popular club back yeah. then. Yeah. And um, I remember, and they had 30, maybe 30 people in the audience. And I remember thinking to myself, this stays, you know, when somebody becomes super famous, you, you remember the first time you saw them. And anyway, this stayed with me. I'm watching them going, wow, this singer is completely ripping off Jim Dandy. He's doing every shtick that Jim Dandy does. And I know Jim Dandy because my sister was dating one of the guitar players. My older sister 
you know, was dating one of the guys. So I saw that band come to L.A., try to get a record deal, and I went to a bunch of their shows. And, and um, you know, when I saw David Lee Roth, I just go, God, he's ripping off. But I go, but wait a minute, this guitar player is amazing, <laughs> you know. So Eddie just was blowing me away. You know, and, and Michael Anthony's vocals were killer. I go, wow, this, you know, it's a really good band, except for that guy. <laughs> just, I've never been a David Lee Roth fan, although he is a great performer, you know, and he took he took elements. I mean, people borrow from from everybody, I guess. But, I mean, he was a clone. The long, Even the way he looked, everything about it, the way he dressed, his rap, hot nasty, it was the same thing. It, it's, it, was, it was like a carbon copy of Jim Dandy. You know, but anyway, that's, Did you, that was my impression. I was going to say, were you guys aware at the time of what was going on in the UK? Because while it was all very melodic before Quiet Riot broke it, over in Europe, in the UK in particular, they had the, the new wave of, of British heavy metal, the likes of Diamond Head, uh, Iron Maiden, obviously. You know, were you guys fully aware of uh, of those bands? Well, I know uh, you went on to tour with with Maiden yeah, on was, the uh, Number of the Beast tour. I was I was a fan of you know, Judas Priest. I know you know back then when I was younger, a huge fan of that. I was never really into heavy heavy metal like that. I did see Iron Maiden open for UFO um, when I was a kid, which was great. But I never was like super. Um, into the super heavy metal stuff. Uh, that's not just not, even though I can play it and, you know, I did it in Politary, which is pretty heavy and Blackthorn, which is heavy. Some albums that I've done were pretty heavy, but it's not my thing really. Uh, again, back to what I, what I just put in this new album that just came out today, by the way. Um, that's what I'm about <laughs> musically more so. Although I, I gotta tell you, I enjoy playing hard rock live. It's like, you just go for it and it's, it's intense and it's fun and it's, it's crazy and the crowds are crazy and it's, it's a great time. I've been over to Europe a lot and those audiences are just insane. It's just, it's hard to describe the energy that you're getting back when you're on stage with a crowd like that. It's, it's just amazing. I mean, who you guys were mixing with was at the time in the, the early 80s with, with Quiet Riot when Mental Health came out was just a, a who's who of rock uh, royalty. I mean, I mentioned Iron Maiden. You went on the Black Sabbath, the Born Again tour, well, which had Gillen on. Well, look, um, and see. I don't know whether you ever heard this, but Gillen had some very, very funny things to say about that time. First of all, the Stonehenge set, where um, they had instances of small people falling off these um, fake Stonehenge stones and him pinning the lyrics to the bottom of the stage because he didn't know all the songs, uh, not realising how much dry ice <laughs> was coming up off the stage. Well, and so he had to keep disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I know, um, I did tour the Purple, so, you know, I did I did the Perfect Strangers tour with Jafria. We opened up from there. But that's a great story. I didn't know about the Stonehenge thing. Everybody it is Spinal Tap, if you ever wonder where it came from. And I, by the way, I don't know whether you saw in the, the music news, they're doing a sequel to Spinal Tap. I have, and you know, they could use they could use a, a, an incident that happened when I was touring with Alice Cooper. Um, you know, there's a there's a part in the show where, where he's in a straitjacket and they, they drag him out, out of this chair and they throw him into a guillotine. And uh, the drummer at the time is Eric Singer from Kiss, and he's doing that brrrr, bah, but you know, like the execution's about to start. The executioner's there with the hood, and he's holding the rope. And he yells, "Die!" Drops the guillotine. It stops halfway, and the head falls off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they hurriedly rush him up. And Alice also he does a bit where, where um, during the show he's building. There's this tube, and he he takes body parts that are all over the stage and the head that came off, and he builds basically him inside inside this tube and closes it up and then there's the drum solo everybody goes off stage the tube fills up we're all ready to go with smoke the tube fills up with smoke he gets in that tube but it didn't open he couldn't get out he was in there <laughs> that's spinal tap <laughs> Holy, I mean. Jeffria. Uh, because that debut album that you were on in 1994, ha 1984 rather, uh -huh. yeah, had a huge reaction 
at the time. Uh, two massive singles, Call to the Heart and uh, Lonely in Love, were, were two, um, two big hits. You had Andy Johns involved. Now, again, he was almost royalty for the time that he worked with Zepp and the Stones and Free and, and had also produced as well. As a collective, it was it was a product very much of its time, but it's travelled time exceedingly well. I listened to it again yesterday, and it's a very, very good listenable album. It is, um, and I actually I did three albums with, with Andy over the years um, back then, and um, he's a character, man. I'm telling you, do you talk about stories? You want to hear stories? Sit with that guy for a while, talking about. <laughs> You know, you call Jimmy Page Pagey. You know, Pagey was over, you know, playing this guitar part. <laughs> it's, it's like hilarious, man. But I love that guy. He was great. He was really, really, really great. And I, I'm sad he's gone. Um, we've lost too many. I, Gary, uh, Gary Miller, a friend of mine, producer, just passed a couple of days ago. It's just, it's just, it's sad. All that keeps happening. As we get older, I guess, to be expected. It's true. Why did they not become a huge band? Well, what, what was the what was the issue? Because I, everything I, about I, them I, pointed I, to it. I think I think two issues. The band established itself with a journey esque pop type song, which was a hit, but the band had a very difficult name. Uh, Jafria, most people didn't get it. In fact, we had posters in stores that told you how to say the name, right? <laughs> the, band, the band would have been called Wet Paint. We would have done better, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, people just didn't get it. You have to be, you know, you too. Make it simple. Beatles, sim- 